Okay, so uh, you get a little bit of a pause here now with the exam behind us. Your next homework assignment's not due until Tuesday the 9th. So that's a week from Tuesday the 9th. That doesn't make sense, right? Today's the 2nd. Now it makes sense. If I change this to 2, then that makes more sense. So yeah, the October 9th. I think I just forgot to update the day. So today's the 2nd. Yeah, the assignment's due on the 9th. Um, tomorrow's lab, for those of you who are taking my lab, we're going to be doing stability of floating bodies. Uh, I apologize that I haven't been able to grade the labs that you've submitted already. I got a little bit behind schedule from grading exams, but I'm going to get on that this afternoon and hopefully knock out both of the labs that you've previously submitted so that uh, we enter this week's lab without one kind of hanging over us. If you'd like to get an early look at the handout for that, I'll post it on MU Online and then I'll also bring a printed copy into the lab tomorrow. Today we're going to start talking about different flow types and flow visualization, and we're in chapter four of your book. I hope you're following along because the book is a good source of like that extra point of view you need to really understand the material. Um, what's exciting about chapter four is till now we've always been assuming that the water was static. And if you look at the world, most of the times the water isn't static. You know, the hydrostatic equation, well, it's only going to get you so far in reality. Most of the time in civil engineering, what we're interested in is water moving through a gutter or water moving through a pipe, either like a water delivery pipe to your house or a sewer pipe from your house somewhere else. Uh, we're going to be looking at flow through rivers and streams and channels. And so all the really interesting, exciting stuff in civil engineering, we need more sophisticated equations to describe what's happening than the hydrostatic equation. The hydrostatic equation is good in some situations, but now in chapter four, we're going to start addressing the reality of energy loss due to the movement of water. So before we can get into that, we have to talk about different types of water movement and how we can look at it, ways to visualize the movement of water. Um, why does fluid motion even matter? Well. Fluid motion matters because most of the infrastructure, like dams, is water flowing through conduits. And so in order to address how the water behaves in situations like that, we have to either keep track of fluid particles or we have to keep track of elements of, of water. Now what I mean by fluid particles is the Lagrangian approach to fluid mechanics. If we wanted to answer the question, what is the fluid velocity? So if that was the question that needed to be answered, then what the Lagrangian approach would be, would be you look inside of some sort of a uh, window and you keep track of the actual particles inside of that window. And we could draw a line of the, the path that the particles are taking. And so we try and track those particles through space and time. Because right now they're in one spot, but a second later they're going to be in a different position because of their velocity. And so in three dimensions, what we would be doing is we would have to keep track of the I, J, K. And so that's the Cartesian system that kind of relates to what we often think of X, Y, and Z. We would just have some vector that describes the velocity in three dimensions of every particle in a system. But of course, some systems are really big, and it would be a challenge to take the derivative of a position of every single particle over time to develop the velocity of that particle because there's just so many particles in a system. So the Lagrangian approach is limited by our ability to keep track of many different fluid elements over time, especially if there's a lot of turbulence and a lot of variance in the system. Some of the particles going one direction, some of the particles going another direction. It can be a challenge to apply the Lagrangian approach, and so we need some sort of a shortcut to help us predict what is the fluid velocity? So instead, in the Eulerian approach, what we do is we broke, break a flow field into representative elements. And we just consider certain fixed uh, locations inside of a, uh, an area of interest. You can see this image. We say that there are certain windows in the flow field. And what we'll do here is we'll look at this position, and we'll just use a single particle inside of that window to represent all of the other particles that are inside of that window. 
So we kind of like assign an average flow velocity inside of these windows, and then we keep track of a much smaller number of fluid elements, like a mesh, and uh, it reduces the computational challenge of keeping track of all of those particles. So now, if we want to calculate the, the velocity in these three dimensions, in x, y, and z, or here u would be the horizontal, v would be vertical, and w would be in the third dimension, uh, over time, because not only do these particles have the ability to change velocity with respect to their location, but also they're changing over time, then it becomes a little bit easier to break a flow field up into these windows. So we'll, we'll get a look at both the Lagrangian approach and the Eulerian approach this semester. In fact, we've got an equation we're going to learn here in Chapter 4 called the Euler's Equation. And so you'll see what, uh, what both of those entail when we come to problem solving. So understanding velocity. What does this picture tell us about what's going on and about the velocities? What could you say about fluids and velocities from this picture? For instance, do you have any clues about the direction of fluid movement in this picture? Where is, this is in a wind tunnel. I guess everybody probably already guessed that. Which direction is the wind blowing? Yeah, over the top of the car, from the front towards the back. What are the clues about that? What's the visual clue that tells you it's not the other way around? How do you know that it's not the wind is going from the back towards the front? Okay. The disturbance of the currents. We don't see anything in the back area. Um, what about the density of the smoke? Look at uh, how it's more dense here and it's less dense there. What, is, what does that tell us? And why is that significant? It's disturbing. It's starting to break up. What this is, is it's the process. It's called diffusion that when it was emitted from, presumably they've got some sort of a dispenser, you know, like a, a tube, and there's an opening. And when the smoke is coming out of the opening, it's all together. But then as it gets further away from that opening, it's diffusing outward. Just like if I lobbed a smoke grenade in the back of the room, the, the smoke would start to fill the rest of the room. We'd start coughing and everything. But it would begin in one corner, and it would slowly move to fill the rest of the room. So the same thing happens here, where we can just look, even though this is just a split second in time, this is just one brief moment, we can get some clues from this picture about the direction of the, uh, the, direction of the fluid flow. Um, also, we can tell where the velocity increases. These are called um, streamlines. This smoke, th this is an illustration of a streamline. And so where these streamlines come together, what it means is that the velocity is higher. So over the top of the car, right here, the velocity of the air is faster than it was here. Now, it's a little tricky because we're looking at it from like an angle. But you still get the sense that these streamlines are closer together. Why do you think the velocity of the gas is faster as it goes over the top of the car than it was in front of the car. Mm -hmm. the, the car is forcing it up, absolutely. Uh, the energy part, it has more velocity, but it has less pressure. And so there's no net energy increase, but the energy is changing form. We'll talk about that. That's an application of the Bernoulli equation. But when these streamlines come together, that means that the, the wind velocity is speeding up. It has to speed up to get over this and reach at the end. Um, it's the, similar to a wing, you know, the Bernoulli effect on a wing. Uh, the air velocity is faster on the top of the wing than it is on the bottom, and that's what gives it lift. There's an increase in pressure under the wing, a de decrease in pressure over the wing. It causes lift. We'll talk about the Bernoulli effect, but 
The point here is that flow visualization is important. It can give us some important clues about the direction and the magnitude, relative magnitude of the velocity. But there are limitations to that. We can't look at this picture and know how fast the wind is going. Maybe it's uh, 20 miles an hour. Maybe it's 100 miles an hour. We can't know exactly. Um, so let's talk about different types of flow and how to visualize it. I already said this word, streamlines. These smoke streaks uh, were streamlines. What they are is they're local velocity vectors that are tangent to uh, where the velocity vector is tangent to the streamline. Uh, indicates the direction of the velocity vector. So there's two different water situations here. This is an open channel on the left, and the clue there that it's open to the atmosphere is these little ripples. That's meant to kind of uh, bring to mind what water looks like as it shimmers. Uh, the other clue is that we have this black line on the bottom, but no black line on the top. So on the left here, it's open channel flow. And what the blue lines tell us is that the water's flowing to the right, and they're parallel. So that means that the water isn't speeding up. As long as it's parallel, then that means that the water is, uh, is maintaining speed with respect to its position in the flow field. The same thing is true on the right, but this is pipe flow on the right, because we don't see that shimmering at the surface. There's no ripples. It's, the water is all the way around. Now, this is a cross-sectional view, so it's a circular pipe, but we're just seeing a cutout of it. Now, here are some streamlines that aren't always parallel. And so when it's not parallel, that means that the fluid is changing velocity. And velocity has two components. It has direction and magnitude. And so in this case, as the water exits a tank out of an opening, this is an orifice, and so water is gushing out of a hole in the tank. So the velocity is changing direction and magnitude as it goes through that opening. Um, here, the streamlines, as, as air goes over uh, a wing, the streamlines are showing the uh, velocity direction. It's also showing here there's a stagnation point as on the front leading edge of the wing, uh, some of the air stagnates right along that leading edge. Um, streamlines can uh, show when the, steady, when the flow conditions are unsteady and ununiform. So this is a pipe that's decreasing in diameter. So this image shows that the big cross-sectional area is tapering down to a smaller cross-sectional area. And so um, we kind of instinctively know that if you've got a smaller diameter pipe, then the water is going to be moving at a faster speed as it exits. I mean, if you've ever put your thumb over a hose, you do that, and then the water squirts faster. Like it, you can get, you spray your friend across the room if you put your thumb over the hose because um, by decreasing the cross-sectional area for the same flow rate, the velocity has to increase. And so the, the streamlines show us that because they are not parallel. They're getting closer together. That means the velocity is going up. This is rotational flow. It's kind of like a whirlpool. The water is going in a circle. And although the magnitude of the velocity may be constant, the direction of velocity is changing. And so that means that we have uh, conditions that are non-uniform. So uniform versus non-uniform. Let's talk about that. There's different types of flow and different classifications. By the way, what is it when something goes from zero velocity to having some positive velocity? What causes a change in velocity? Acceleration, Acceleration right. So keep that in the back of your mind. Acceleration causes velocity changes. We're going to be talking about different things that cause acceleration. So uniform flow is when there's no acceleration. It means that in the direction that the water is moving, velocity is constant. So here, this was our open channel. In the direction of flow, the velocity stays the same. Same thing with this pipe. 
So the change in velocity with respect to position, here S is some direction axis. So we're saying in the direction of the velocity change, I'm sorry, in the direction of flow, the velocity is not changing. So the change in velocity with respect to position is zero when we have uniform flow. Non-uniform means that as you move in the direction of uh, flow that the velocity is changing. And so both of these are illustrations of non-uniform flow. Because either the magnitude or the direction, one of those two is changing. Sometimes I get uh, short answer questions on exams. And so if you had to explain the difference between uniform flow and non-uniform flow, what I'd hope you'd remember is that it's talking about flow with respect to position. And non-uniform flow is when some aspect of the velocity, either the magnitude or the uh, direction, is changing with respect to position. Now, we haven't talked about time yet. We've just talked about position. So if the flow rate is constant, so we have always like maybe one liter per second going into this nozzle and one liter per second coming out of the nozzle, even if the flow rate is constant, that still means that there's some acceleration happening here. Like the water is accelerating because it has a faster velocity as it exits than when it entered. So keep in mind that any time there is a change in velocity, there had to have been an acceleration. Okay, uniform versus non-uniform. Another way to classify flow is steady versus unsteady. So steady flow says that over time, the velocity is constant. So rather than talking about velocity in terms of position, now we're talking about velocity in terms of time. Of course, unsteady is the opposite of that. It's saying that in unsteady flow that the velocity is changing over time. But I don't have any pictures up on the slide here. You know, we can't use streamlines to tell us whether the flow is steady or unsteady. We did have streamlines. These streamlines do tell us whether the flow is uh, uniform or non-uniform. But a picture can't tell us if conditions are steady or unsteady. Steady versus unsteady is all about time. And a picture is just one moment in time. And so, you know, at an instant, you don't know if the velocity is going to be changing in the future. So to, to see unsteady flow, what you need is a series of images. So let's look at some unsteady flow. Uh, this is a, a great illustration of conditions that are changing with respect to time. At the beginning of the video, what we saw was a dry riverbed and people hiking up the riverbed. If these people were still standing down here one minute later, they'd be getting swept downstream and probably banged up pretty badly. Uh, so that is a great illustration of flow conditions changing over time. So you need to be able to differentiate between unsteady flow and non-uniform flow. But Conditions can be both unsteady and non-uniform. So what we could make is a matrix. We could have a table where the conditions are steady and unsteady, uniform and non-uniform. So you can have situations where the flow is both steady and uniform. What that would mean was, it, let's say if you have a pipe and water is flowing through the pipe, the diameter is the same, so that means that the velocity is the same with respect to position, so that would be uniform. What would make it steady? What would we need for a flow through a pipe to be steady? What's the definition of steady? Conditions are not changing over time. So for it to be steady, it would need, mean that we need to control the, fl the flow rate of water into that pipe over time. Okay? If we had a pipe, how could we make it, it would, 
It's always going to be uniform as long as the diameter is the same. But how could we change that pipe to have unsteady flow? What would we need to be doing to have uniform, unsteady flow? Okay. There's no control. Yeah, so what we just saw on the video, like if it's water that's entering a drainage pipe, that's a great example. Runoff from a watershed is a great example of unsteady flow because, you know, like in the peak part of the rainstorm, there's a lot of water going to those uh, pipes, and that's when the road gets all backed up here in Huntington. Um, so another example is if we had pressurized flow, if we had a valve, and if we we're gradually opening up that valve over time, then the velocity would be increasing because of our flow control measure. So uh, we can have combinations of these different flow types. Another way to classify flow is whether the conditions are laminar or turbulent. So uh, laminar flow is characterized of relatively slow velocities. And if we had a pipe and water was flowing through a pipe with laminar conditions, then what we would see is a velocity profile that looks like this. Um, at the edges of the pipe, where the water is in contact with the solid material, the velocity would be zero because of the no-slip condition that says that the liquid velocity has to be the same as the velocity of the surface that's in contact with. So in this case, if the pipe is stationary, then the water real close to the pipe is stationary as well. But the further away you get, from the edge of that pipe than the increase in velocity because there's less resistance. What laminar flow conditions entails is a really smooth kind of bullet-shaped profile. And you can calculate the laminar, whether conditions are laminar because the Reynolds number will be less than 2,000. Um, so Reynolds number is the density of the fluid multiplied by the velocity that it's moving multiplied by the diameter of the pipe, divided by the fluid viscosity. That's one way to calculate Reynolds number. You may remember that uh, there's something called kinematic viscosity. Kinematic viscosity is the absolute viscosity divided by the density. And so Reynolds number, in terms of kinematic viscosity, is just velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. So this is another formula for Reynolds number, which just kind of combines the density and the viscosity term together. Turbulent conditions are characterized by relatively fast moving water or fluids that uh, have a lower viscosity. Uh, the Reynolds number has to be above 4,000 for conditions to be turbulent. So we've got some middle ground there. Between 2,000 and 4,000 is transition flow. But turbulent conditions are going to have a different shape of the velocity profile. It flattens it out a lot because instead of a predictable increase in velocity the further away you get from the edge of the pipe, what happens is there's a lot of randomness inside of turbulent uh, flow. And so what this illustration from the, figure, uh, from the book is showing is the velocity may be higher than average in some spots, lower than average in other, because there's a lot of interaction with the pipe wall that kind of causes deflection and shearing and um, unpredictable behavior when the conditions are turbulent. So uh, let's practice using this formula for Reynolds number and diagnose whether conditions are laminar or turbulent as described here. What if we have a relatively large diameter pipe? What if we have a, a pipe diameter that's 2.5 meters and we have a relatively low velocity that the velocity of water through the pipe is 0 0.1 meters per second we want to know, uh, in part A, what is the Reynolds number in this situation? So the Reynolds number, uh, you need to know, I guess, the density and the viscosity of water. So let me give that to you. Water 
we know that the uh, density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The typical room temperature value for absolute viscosity is 1 times 10 to the minus third Newton seconds per meter squared. Okay, so with that, let's calculate whether conditions are laminar or turbulent by calculating the Reynolds number. All right, so uh, Reynolds number can be calculated either with kinematic viscosity or with uh, absolute viscosity. Uh, kinematic viscosity, the typical value for water, is 1 times 10 to the minus 6th meter squared per second. That's the kinematic viscosity. And so in our case, we have water that's flowing at 0 0.1 meters per second, and the diameter is 2.5 meters. And the kinematic viscosity of water is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. And so that means that here our Reynolds number is 250,000. So are conditions laminar or turbulent? They're turbulent. Yeah. Even though the water's moving very slowly here, uh, 0.1 meter per second is quite slow. You know, like what's a typical flow velocity through a municipal pipe? Um, probably less than three meters per second. You know, three meters per second is pretty fast. Any more than that, it could cause some like scour issues um, and a lot of head loss, a lot of energy loss due to pipe friction. But here, what this is uh, kind of hinting at is that it's pretty uncommon to see laminar conditions. Most of the time we see turbulent. So this is turbulent. And most of the time flow is turbulent. But you can specifically design things to be laminar. This is asking in part B, what's the maximum flow velocity that we could have uh, in order to ensure laminar flow conditions? So in other words, let's set Reynolds number equal to 2,000 and solve for the diameter. All right, I'm sorry, flow velocity. Let's we'll solve for V. So if we rearrange, V is Reynolds number times kinematic viscosity divided by diameter. So that's 2,000 multiplied by 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meter squared per second. And then we divide that by the diameter of 2.5 meters. So that means that if we want to see laminar conditions inside of that tube, we have to go 0 0.0008 meters per second. So that's 0 0.8 millimeters per second. That's pretty slow. Yeah, question. Does the, does the Reynolds number, is it kind of work to be a loop? Is it kind of work like a phasing factor where it kind of like, it's like a, it's like a multiplier, like the larger the Reynolds number, the more turbulent it is? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. In fact, we have a lab experiment where we're actually going to be looking at the turbulence of, uh, of water by injecting a stream of dye down through a tube. And um, the tube is going to have water flowing through it, but it won't have to go quite this slow because we're going to use, we're not going to use a 2.5 meter diameter tube. We're going to use a much smaller diameter tube, so that'll decrease how low the velocity has to go before we can see laminar conditions. All right, so the ways that we've talked about to classify flow so far is steady versus unsteady, uniform versus non-uniform, and laminar versus turbulent. With those three, we can actually uh, understand a lot of how water moves. Let's just summarize. Um, uniform versus non-uniform is when we're considering how velocity changes with respect to position. Steady versus unsteady is how velocity changes with respect to time. The reason why there's so much white space under this slide is we're going to fill it in. There's going to be more comparisons, like different formulas we use to do calculations for non-uniform flow compared to unsteady flow. So there's more space because as we talk more about how the applications uh, arise from these differences, we need more space to keep track of the differences. OK, um, for the remaining time that we have today, we're going to talk about flow visualization, just looking at 
moving fluids. And we've discussed a streamline already. That's the smoke that was going over the, uh, the car inside the wind tunnel. And it tells us the direction that the fluid's velocity is taking. But it doesn't tell us directly the, uh, the magnitude of the velocity. It can give us a relative idea where the velocity is increasing. But you can't know directly what's the absolute, velo absolute uh, velocity. There's other ways to visualize flow. And, uh, one of them is a path line. And a path line is just what it sounds like. If you followed a particle over time and then connect the dots, that's a path line. It sort of shows you where the item was and all the way up to where it is now. And connect the dots. It's the path that a certain <laughs> particle took. Now what's tricky is the streak line. A streak line also gives you an idea of the fluid history over time, but um, it is created not by tracking a particle and its location over time, but a streak line rather exists when you inject some sort of a tracer at a fixed location, and then the fluid velocity is changing during that time that the tracer is being injected. So it shows you the history of what the flow movement has been by looking at the streak and where the streak changes. Okay, so let's take into uh, consideration the following. What if before a certain time the water was going to the right, then after that time it's going to the right and upward? So there's two different times. There's before and after. So that's what's being illustrated in this figure in your text. It's showing that initially the flow is to the right, and so we're looking at both the streamlines and also the path line. So for part of the time, the particle got pushed to the right. So these blue lines that are going horizontally, that caused the movement of the particle to the right. You can see the starting point. But then the direction of velocity changed. And so these streak lines that are up and to the right, those represent the direction after t0. And then that changed the direction that the particle took. Now, it doesn't change the path line from before. You know, This path line is showing where it was during the first period. And that doesn't change based on the fact that now the direction is adjusted. Now, the streak lines, it's an actual physical thing. It's not just the path that the, thing, that the thing took, but imagine that you're injecting dye at a certain location. And so we've always been injecting dye here at this spot. And so this, this end of the line right here represents the first droplets of dye that got injected. Like when we started injecting the dye, this is the oldest tracer that's in the water right here. Now this right here is the tracer that's being injected right now at T naught. Then remember, after T naught, the flow direction changed. Now the water is going up and to the right. And so what that does is it pushes the entire streak line, including the old stuff, it pushes it up and to the right. And so now, the dye is still being injected at this location. And this is the first dye that got injected. But it got shifted and translated sideways because the flow direction changed over time. So people sometimes look at this and reasonably assume, oh, well, maybe the streak line is always just a mirror image of the path line. And unfortunately, it's not that simple. That's just a coincidence of this drawing. Like if you're actually in a position where you need to sketch the streak line. The best way to do it is to hold your pencil or pen in a fixed location and move the paper in the direction uh, that the water would move. And so rather than moving your pencil, you move the paper. Because that's really what's happening with a streak line, is a streak line is showing the history of where the fluid was and, um, and how it's changed. So uh, I've got a handout for you so you can get some practice drawing streamlines, streak lines, and path lines. And what we are going to do is look at 
four distinct time periods. Oh, okay. Before we do the handout, let me do this example. Um, let me do this example. I guess you could draw on the back of your paper for this one, just to give you an idea. All right. Uh, so what's on the screen is a little bit different from the in-class exercise. On the screen, there is uh, water flowing to the right for nine seconds, then down for four seconds and then to the left for six seconds. And so um, the path line, to draw the path line, it's going to look like an object is getting pushed around by the water. So if this is the starting location, then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine units of movement to the right. And it gets pushed down four units. One, two, three, four. And I guess we're assuming that the velocity during each of these times is the same. So the distance that it's covering is going to be the same. And then it moves six units to the left. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And now we have to connect all of these dots. And here's the path line. So the path line has a start and an end. So start is uh, t equals 0. So this is where the particle was at t equals 0. And then it looks like this is a total of 19 seconds. So this is at the end t equals 19. This is where the particle would be after 19 seconds. Now to draw the uh, streak line, the way to, to do it is to move the paper in the direction of flow. So if I have a piece of paper and I'm going to hold my pen steady, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, move the paper to the right nine units. So this is where I'm injecting the uh, streak. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I'm going to move the paper down four units. 1, 2, 3, 4, and then move the paper to the left, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now I can connect the dots and remember that the start is here. So the start is where I began the streak line and the end at time equals 19. Um, I'm still injecting the dye at the same location, but the, um, the, the surrounding water has moved. OK, so with that example, now try the handout. There's two questions here. Um, just for simplicity, in the handout, what we're assuming is that any time the water is flowing at an angle, then it's going at 1.41 times faster. That just means that it's going to be one block every time. Because you know the, uh, the distance, the hypotenuse is longer than either of the edges. So that's why I said that the velocity when it's traveling at an angle is 1.41 times faster. So in part one, I'd like you to uh, trace the path line. And then in part two, I'd like you to trace the streak line.
like. So here's the path line. The path line is the easy one to do. It just shows that, you know, it was some particles released at A, and then it just bobs around, getting pushed by the water changing direction over time. What's trickier though is to draw the uh, here where we need to draw the streak line. Um, I started by getting the shape of it. And it, it looks a little bit squiggly and wavy and so on, because I was actually pushing the paper in the direction that was indicated by the arrows. And so let me show you the first segment of the line that I drew was this bottom one. So here we've got three units, and the, the water was moving to the right. And so what that does is the line goes to the left because the paper was moving to the right. So three seconds. This is the first part of the flow. So the, the, the oldest streak line is here. And then the arrow goes down. So that means the paper goes down, the line goes up. So the, the streak line is up here because this whole thing got shifted downward. Uh, then we got to go sideways from seconds 5 through 9. So you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that gets us this one. And then finally, two seconds to the right. So here's those two seconds. And so this is the first tracer that was injected. And this was the last. The last thing that happened was this little drop of tracer there. So if we translate that shape over to B, then we can say, if we were pouring some sort of a tracer in at B the whole time, but what was changing was the flow field, then this is what the zigzag pattern would look like in the uh, in the streak line at the end of that time period. OK, uh, that's it for today. Remember that uh, you do have a homework assignment. You could get started on. Some of this stuff is just as simple as flow visualization. Uh, so you can get an early start on that. I'll see you in lab tomorrow for Metacentric Height. Have a good day.